Well, this is a special episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. I am so excited. I'm actually at Houston Methodist Hospital here with Dr. Huey Lin, and I want to welcome you to the Heart to Heart with Anna show today. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and a real honor to finally get here. I know it's been three years that I've been begging you to come on the show. <laughs> I just had to drive to Houston to make it happen. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm so glad to have you here. Well, this is really exciting for me. I've been here before for some of your fabulous conferences, and that's basically what we're going to talk about today. Great. We have another conference coming up in a couple weeks. That's right, in now, October. Yes, and so let's start by having you tell us who some of the, the great speakers are that you're flying in, because I know you always have people from all over the country come to speak at your conference. Yeah, that's great. So <clears throat> one of my favorite people in the world is Ari Cedars, um, and he's one of the adult congenital heart physicians um, at UT Southwestern now. Um, and he and I sort of really came up with this concept to begin with of actually having this type of congenital heart symposium for adults. And as some of you may know, it's slightly different than many of the other um, meetings that we have in adult congenital heart disease because what we want to do is we want to really focus on educating people who may not otherwise be educated. So on one hand, what we're interested in is educating people like primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, um, and primary cardiologists who may not have a very significant background in congenital heart disease. And at the same time, we're also interested in educating patients and their family members and their loved ones and friends who also may not know a whole lot about congenital heart disease. And so that way, um, we can actually dovetail a lot of what we actually do um, so that we can serve both of those different communities and actually serve the congenital heart community on a whole. Right, and for me, as the parent of a child who is now an adult with a congenital heart defect, something like this is so important. Absolutely. When Alex was first diagnosed, I thought, how am I supposed to understand all of this? My background is as a teacher of the deaf. And so we kind of assumed that the heart's okay, and we focused on the ears. And when I first found out about my son's heart condition, they didn't really give him much of a chance to survive to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't worry about teaching me too much about him becoming an adult. Yeah. But there is so much to learn. And now that we have a larger and larger cohort of people who are surviving to adulthood, we're finding out that there are new problems, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's probably the most fundamental problem to begin with, is we've been playing catch up for many decades at this point. So your experience is just like the many, the experience of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, patients out there, which is that doctors never knew exactly after they had their surgery how long this kid is going to survive for. So they could never tell the families, oh, you know, you're going to have X kind of life expectancy, or you can plan to have a family, or you can plan to get married, you can plan to have kids, etc. We never knew that back then. And so mm -hmm. the problem is now we're getting to the point where, oh my goodness, well, we're actually finding out not only can you have a family, you can have grandkids too. <laughs> um, I mean, I have some patients who are reaching their 80s at this point. Wow. And so we're playing catch up with trying to take care of these patients and helping these patients take care of themselves and helping their families take care of them as well. And mm -hmm. so in a lot of ways, we think of this almost as a public health outreach type of program mm -hmm. where we really want to reach out to not just patients, but their friends and their family members and you know, um, their physicians as well. So that way we can get everybody on board with the idea, well, guess what? You're gonna live past your childhood. You're gonna live into your adulthood. And guess what? We need to continue taking care of you. And there are very specific things that we need to do to take care of you in the right way. And as part of this, of course, we need to educate the physicians also who are gonna be taking care of them as well. Yeah, I think that's a real serious issue that maybe has been overlooked for a long time. Absolutely. I know that when I took my son to the pediatrician, I actually had to change pediatricians a couple of times mm -hmm. because not all pediatricians are comfortable dealing with children who are between open heart surgeries. Yeah. That can be a really scary thing. But I was able to find a good physician who had had a child with a single ventricle heart, and he was fabulous until my son was about two. And I couldn't understand why he seemed to be getting more and more distant. Mm. And then I found out that none of his heart patients had lived past two. And wow. I think he was afraid to get too close to my son yeah. for fear that he was just going to die as well. Yeah. He was still really close to my older son, and I had known him for five years, mm. but I had to switch physicians and find somebody who had more experience and who knew that these kids could make it. I think one of the things that's really interesting, though, is the second physician that I found 
knew that I had written a book and I gave him a copy of my book and he said, you know what, I consider you the expert. I want you to help guide me. Mm -hmm. And at first that felt awkward, but now I think if I were in the same position, I would say, you know what, there's this wonderful conference in Houston <laughs> <laughs> where you can get some continuing education yeah. on working with patients with congenital heart disease. Exactly. One of the problems we have as parents is when do we call? We don't want to be that hovering mother or hovering parent who calls every time your child has a runny nose. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you don't want your kid to get RSV and end up in the hospital. Does this conference help with training the physicians to handle parents like us? Wow. Well, that's an interesting question because I think what we're trying to do specifically is take care of um, families and patients with uh, who are adults with congenital heart disease. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I really know how to answer your question about RSV <laughs> specifically. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, you bring up a really good point, which is that at the end of the day, um, what we can't expect is that we're going to find physicians out in the community or anywhere, really, who don't specialize in adult congenital heart disease coming out of the box and knowing exactly how to take care right. of adults with congenital heart disease. So that is where we feel our burden is, is mm -hmm. to educate these physicians and these care providers to take care of adults with congenital heart disease because nobody's going to know, right? right? I mean, the reality is we can't go around expecting um, a family care uh, provider or um, an obstetrician or an orthopedist to know how to take care of adults with congenital heart disease, right? It right. just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it is our job as a community of adult congenital heart providers to go out and try to educate people to understand the basics, to understand the things that they need to know about taking care of adults with congenital heart disease. And so eventually be able to answer some of these questions about, well, you know, if I do have the sniffles, or I do have a cold, or I do have the flu, what do I do? Or right. should I get the flu shot this year? Mm -hmm. The answer is almost always yes. yes. So <laughs> Parents too. Yes. Anybody uh, living in the house with that person? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Everybody around them as well. Right, right. That's right. So um, so that's what, what our hope is. And we're hoping that we'll just be one of the programs that are going to be doing this, that in the mm -hmm. future that there will be many, many programs who are doing this as well, because this is really the mission of adult congenital heart uh, disease doctors. So will you be recording your sessions and make them available online? Absolutely. And actually, we've been doing that every year for the last five years, or sorry, the last four years. This will be our fifth one. Um, and so actually today, if you want to go and you want to find some of these um, uh, programs that we've done in the past, you can actually get on our YouTube site and actually find our old programs. Um, and so um, you'll see on, those, um, on that site, we have not only the patient and family programs as well as the physician programs. And I find both of them very, very effective and very powerful mm -hmm. um, for everybody, um, irrespective of whether you're a healthcare provider or a patient or family member. Right, last year I got a chance to sneak into the professional one for mm -hmm. a little bit, and Dr. Amy Bott was yes. presenting. She is amazing. She's fantastic. Is she coming back again this year? Uh, no, I think she's already committed to some other things this year. Okay. So um, it's hard, right, because I think the, at the end of the day, adult congenital heart disease doctors are committed to so many different things. Oh, I know. So things, but so. you always manage to get great people. Dr. Ari Cedars has been on my program before, yeah. and he's really good about about helping to educate people. Who else do you have coming as a speaker? Yeah, so I'm really excited that um, that we're going to be inviting a number of different speakers from this territory. So one of the things that we're starting to move towards is trying to identify other adult congenital heart disease providers in Texas and then neighboring states like Louisiana oh, um, and other places um, in the region. So that way we can start to work together. So one of the secrets mm -hmm. that we do is that we have a faculty um, meeting the day before the symposium. Right. And one of the things that we do at this faculty meeting is we actually deep dive into the things that work and don't work with uh, taking care of adults with congenital heart disease. So mm -hmm. um, typically at a scientific meeting, right, everybody presents their success stories and everybody presents their s research um, findings. Um, I think it's a little bit harder to have an environment where people are going to be candid and honest about areas where things didn't work for their program. I think that's not to say that doesn't happen, but we wanted to create an environment where a small group of ACHD physicians and healthcare providers could get together and actually be very candid about where do things succeed, where do things not succeed, and share their stories and share their experience so that we can all learn from each other.
Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, um, one of the things that we're working towards doing is beginning to create um, a consortium of research programs. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the most important thing that we can do for the community in general is to start to bring together our experience um, and right. to share our strength. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our strength is best when it's actually combined together. Absolutely. And one of the things I love about Texas is that we're one of the leaders especially this hospital, <laughs> is, <laughs> is great. So nice. <laughs> and really, I mean, we're just so lucky. We have this great medical center here, but we also have a fabulous medical center in San Antonio and Dallas. I mean, really, our state boasts a lot of fabulous medical centers. We all need to be working together because Absolutely. there's power in numbers. Absolutely. And congenital heart disease is the number one birth defect, but a lot of people don't know that. Right. And a lot of people don't realize the numbers that we do have out there. I just went to a podcast conference, and so I was talking to people about what their podcast was about, and they were telling me about, they were asking me about my podcast, and I met several people who were touched by congenital heart disease. Mm. So I ended up getting my portable recorder and doing some on the spot interviews That's with people great. who have been touched by congenital heart disease because you just never know yeah. where you're going to meet them and all of these people were adults yeah. who had been touched yeah. so i think that you working with the other physicians that's what's going to be more powerful for the future of our adults with congenital heart disease. So in the last 10 years, I don't even think it's been 10 years, there's the new accreditation mm -hmm. for doctors to be specialized in the care of adults with congenital heart disease. How many of those doctors are here in Texas? Do you know? Wow. Actually, I think that's a rapidly shifting number. Um, Is it? Oh, good. Yeah, it's actually, it's really great because I think there was a time when I think there was less than a handful of us mm -hmm. um, during the first year or during accreditation. But I think now, um, I think the number is skyrocketing pretty quickly. So I, I think we're very fortunate, especially here in the medical center where we have all this different expertise, not only here, but at Texas Children's where they have right. a phenomenal program as well as at University of Texas where they have also a really fantastic program as well. So I think we're very lucky that we're very rich um, in adult congenital heart disease providers. And I think that that's again why it's incumbent upon us as a group to make sure that we help to educate um, everyone around us um, and really make the lives of our patients and their families better. Can you give us an idea of some of the topics that will be discussed at the symposium this year? Yeah, so Dr. Cedars came up with a really great idea. I think most of the time people like to hear and learn from specific stories. Yes. And so what Dr. Cedars came up with was instead of actually having didactic format where we go through lectures on specific um, congenital heart lesions for the providers, what we're actually going to do is we're going to focus on three different specific topics and three different specific patient stories. And mm -hmm. so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the beginning of the patient story from the beginning of when they presented. Um, and then we're going to actually talk about all the things that happened to the patient. So the imaging that they had done, so the echo, the CT scan, the MRI, mm -hmm. and then pro uh, move on to the catheterization and what those catheterization results meant. And then move on to whatever the intervention might have been, whether it's surgery, cath intervention, or electrophysiology ablation, et cetera. And we're hoping if we can actually do that, we can actually really help to allow both patients and families as well as healthcare providers look into a day in the life of the average adult congenital heart physician and understand a little bit more about what actually happens and hopefully have them be more integrated on how this care takes place. One thing that I've learned on the show, and I've recorded now 240 shows. Wow. So I've spoken to a lot of patients and a lot of doctors, but mostly a lot of heart warriors. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how similar the stories are. And I imagine that you doctors are seeing the same kind of cases present or the same kind of symptoms present. My son has a single ventricle heart. And so right now, one of the hot topics is liver concerns yeah. and other organ concerns as Absolutely. they age, which we didn't know about 30 years ago. Yeah. So do you think that these, the concept that Dr. Cedars came up with is to help the physicians to see what a potential, I hate to say textbook, because none of these people are textbook, but a typical, um, presentation might be for a new patient? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we're hoping that if we can 
take some common findings that we often see in these patients mm -hmm. and common issues that we see in these patients that we can sort of help people to recognize and understand a little bit better about the patient that's going to be walking into their office or coming into their practice or coming into their emergency room, for example, um, and then be better, better prepared to um, deal with some of the issues that we're going to be seeing. So. so one of the biggest issues that we have dealt with over the last forever probably, but definitely over the last 20 years or so, is that we'll have patients whose parents are very aggressive at making sure that the children attend all of their doctor's appointments and they have all their scheduled surgeries and then the kids grow up, become adults, and they think they're cured. Yeah. So what are you doctors doing to help future patients know that this is a lifelong condition that requires lifelong education? Yeah, that's actually a really great point. I think that's where um, I think you and I had a conversation that this would be very important for us to have a conversation about today, mm -hmm. which is that we want to invite not just adults with congenital heart disease and their families, but we really want to bring in kids and their families. So we want to bring in parents and their families and, um, and loved ones because this is the future, right? right. So um, in a lot of ways, we learn from patients and their families as well. That's one of the most important things, and that's one of the most important reasons why this is a combined program where we have both healthcare providers as well as patients and their families because we can learn from each other tremendously that way. But more importantly, I think um, we want to start to break this cycle. Right? Mm -hmm. We want to start to break the cycle where nobody knew what to tell the kid when they were growing up. Nobody knew what to tell the parents when they were growing up and so therefore everybody's surprised when the kid grows up and becomes an adult that's healthy and having a family. and you know, working a regular life, right? So what we want to do is we want to get everybody prepared so that, that way they know how to have the best quality of life in their adulthood. And we want to make sure that they have the right kind of care, whether it's primary care, obstetric care, gyne uh, gynecologic care, um, or cardiology care, right? And so I think the best way to do that is to get everybody to come together to this type of environment where they can learn some of these basic um, issues that we're dealing with. And, and then also we want to really empower people. So the afternoon session is going to be focusing on some very important subjects that, again, people tend to shy away from talking about. Mm -hmm. right? So one of the things that we think is most important is learning how to communicate with your healthcare team. Right? Oh, so good. So walk, teaching them to be advocates for themselves. Exactly. Okay. So you walk into a new <laughs> doctor's office, right? And now you need to tell them, well, I had X procedure when I was a newborn. Then I had my second surgery when I was several months. And then I had my third surgery when I was two or three years old. You know, those are the things that we want to be able to help people to communicate with, not only to their doctor, but also, more importantly, sometimes their anesthesiologist right. before surgery. Yes, yes. I'm seeing more and more people who are having non-cardiac surgeries and they're having problems with the anesthesia. And that's something that's really concerning. Now, if you're lucky enough to live in Texas, in, near Houston or Dallas or one of the big cities, or Boston or Philadelphia, then you might be lucky enough to get an anesthesiologist who specializes in the care of those with congenital heart disease, but most of the time people don't. So what kind of advice would you have for somebody like that? Yeah, that's a perfect question. And so I think that's in many ways a million dollar question. But I think from my standpoint or our team, when we talk to our patients, it's so important that we actually arm them with a, basically a stack of uh, paperwork, right? Mm -hmm. We want to give them their operative report. We want to give them their pacemaker implantation information. We want to give them their last catheterization report, their echocardiogram, their cardiac MRI, et cetera. And we ask each one of them to start a binder, right? Mm -hmm. And actually keep all of that for themselves. Now, we're fortunate we actually have an electronic medical record that they can actually download all this data onto their phones, oh, um, which is great. But I think at the end of the day, sometimes, because electronics is electronics, it's still better to make sure you have two copies, right? One paper copy and one electronic copy. And then so that's the beginning of the advice, right? I think mm -hmm. you, know, you need to arm yourself with that information so that when you walk into your next doctor's office, you can give them time afterwards. They can make a copy of that, that paperwork and they can right. actually sit there and peruse through it and try to digest it because it's not easy and it no, takes time. Especially when you have patients like my son who have had three open heart surgeries right. and he's actually one of the easier cases. There are some people <laughs> right. who have 10, 20 procedures. I yeah. don't know how they keep up with it all. It's a lot to keep up with. Absolutely. I do have a binder with all of my son's surgical notes yeah. because those surgical notes are golden. Exactly. And sometimes it's hard to get them. Exactly. And costly. 
Yeah. E either time-wise or money-wise. Absolutely. Okay, so one of the things that I really enjoy doing at your conference is going to see some of the different vendors and yes. they actually let us see the devices. Yeah. Will you have people like that here this time again? Absolutely. So we were really motivated by the fact that we as an institution really love doing medical education. And we have this center called Mighty um, where we actually focus on doing simulation and innovative training. Okay, And so what we typically do is we bring healthcare providers and physicians to actually learn hands-on how to do techniques. And we use all kinds of different simulators and models to actually teach them so they can actually practice it many, many times before they actually do the procedure in a patient. Makes right? a so lot they of can, sense. They can be already have the skills down before they go. Mm -hmm. So we thought, huh, what if we were to take the average healthcare provider who actually doesn't do cardiology procedures and we were to take patients and their family members and bring them to Mighty and actually show them yeah. or even let them play with these devices so that they can actually learn how it actually works. So for example, you know, one of the, my favorite examples is actually showing a transcatheter valve. Yes, that was fun. I got to see that last year. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, this is remarkable, right? I think, mm -hmm. you know, we as physicians often take for granted what transcatheter valve technology is, but it has completely changed the way we can actually look at congenital heart patients at this point in time. So for those of you who don't know, transcatheter valve technology basically allows us to actually implant a new valve via a small incision in one of the arteries or veins of the body as opposed to requiring another open heart surgery. Right, right. So that's the interventional cardiology. Exactly. And quicker time to heal. Right. Usually less chance to have an infection right. or complications. Exactly. So this is really an awesome opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we love about this is um, we want to be able to actually bring physicians of other specialties or primary care as well as patients and family members and actually show them what this actually means and how it's actually done, right? Because mm -hmm. what we do want to do is we want to take away sort of the myths of, oh, it's easy, it's simple, it's 15 minutes and it's done, right? Because yeah, that's no. not what it is either. No. And so when we show them how it actually works, I think people will start to really make more concrete in their minds how this actually works. Um, and so what we're going to do this time around is because we're actually going to be talking about three specific different lesions um, and actually talking about specific cases, what we want to do is we're going to actually take specific devices that are applicable to those, yeah. those lesions. And so that way okay. you have a context, you have a story in which you're actually learning about these devices and mm -hmm. it makes so much more sense. Okay. Well, we have a chance to see an LVAD. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Many different types of LVADs, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. That had that technology itself has come yes. a long way in absolutely. the last decade, hasn't it? Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about ventricular assist devices. Mm -hmm. And so what that basically means is a pump that will sit inside the body to actually help the heart pump. Um, and so there are all kinds of different shapes and sizes and, um, and concepts for a ventricular assist device. Um, but basically they all share the same concept that you really want to help reduce the work that the heart has to do. So in other words, the ventricular assistance. And so they come in uh, types where a surgeon implants it um, directly in the chest, and they come in types where um, somebody like myself, an interventional cardiologist, will put it in from a small incision in an artery or a vein. Really? You can Absolutely. do an LVAD in an artery or a vein? Yeah, it's a temporary uh, ventricular assist device, but yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, because I know about the Berlin Heart mm -hmm. and I know about some of the other kind, but I thought they had to wear a backpack or something right. to carry it with them. I didn't think it was something that actually went inside of their body. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. So I think um, the reason why this has been such a great um, boon for us in the community is that we can basically go from a patient on the table to having a ventricular assist device in within about 15 minutes um, from a percolating wow. standpoint. Now, it's not durable, so in other words, you can't leave the hospital with it, but mm -hmm. if somebody's in really big trouble and their heart is failing quickly, this is something we can do to save them temporarily while we get everything else ready. So we get the surgical team ready, et cetera, et cetera, um, for if they need to go on to have a permanent ventricular assist device implanted. So how many times does somebody go from having an LVAD to transplant? Because that is usually the bridge, right? Yeah, that's right. So this is actually a really interesting um, field. And to be perfectly honest, this is not my area of expertise. I might have to defer to some of our heart failure transplant team members. But I think what we're finding has been really fantastic. As 
unfortunately we don't often talk about is that there are just not that many hearts right. um, to give for transplant. And so that becomes one of the major rate limiting factors. So ventricular assist devices have come to become a bridge um, to transplant. So you can have a patient on a ventricular assist device to allow them to continue to actually have pretty good quality of life mm -hmm. while they're waiting for a transplant. Well, fast forward a little bit and it turns out actually that a lot of patients are actually doing pretty well on the ventricular assist devices alone. And so it's um, now evolved into something called destination therapy, which means that oh. you can just live with the ventricular assist device and have a good quality of life. And we just take it one day at a time and see how that goes and enjoy that quality of life. And you know, as we like to talk about when we start talking about um, 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 uh, thinking about advanced care planning, we like to think about what are my goals? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I, what are, what are the important parts of what I define as quality of life? Right. Um, and when we can actually define those in advance, sometimes these patients who have uh, destination therapy, ventricular assist device, they can achieve those goals. Um, and then we don't need to move on to transplant necessarily for some of those patients. Well, it's interesting that you say that because one of the people that I met at the podcast conference mm -hmm. had a relative who was living with an, with an LVAD yeah. and had been for, I think he said six years. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately he was not a transplant candidate mm -hmm. any longer, but he was still having a quality life. Yeah. And in fact, was getting ready to take a trip to see his mother. And That's great. I was really excited to hear that somebody could live that long on an LVAD. I didn't yeah. know that it was designed for a long-term placement and you know possible substitution for what your heart really is supposed to do. I mean, yeah. I just think that's amazing that there's a little device, well, I shouldn't say little because it's actually kind of big, but that there's a device that can help you so that you can walk your kids to school mm -hmm. or dance at your daughter's wedding or you know do some of those things that would be quality of life issues that maybe you couldn't have done 50 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I think it's a great area that's expanding very rapidly and the technology is improving remarkably. Um, I think it's just a really exciting area to watch. Um, and I think it's really brought a lot of hope to a lot of patients that prior to this really were just waiting for transplants and there were no other options. So I think it's a very exciting yeah. area. That can really be a hopeless feeling. That's one of the things I like about your conference is that we get a chance to go to the different vendors and the vendors can tell us what their devices do how people can get them mm -hmm. and I think that for the common person you don't get a chance to ever see something like that yeah so I appreciate the fact that you make that available to yeah. everybody that, that comes okay talk to us about how expensive it is to attend your conference well so it actually turns out that we just have everybody pay a very small fee so that we will help subsidize for actually really just parking <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> so, yes. yeah. um, because one of the things that you know as you can imagine um, we actually get a lot of support from all these different educational grants um, to the mm -hmm. debate education foundation and in part the um, the program is subsidized by the debate education Foundation. So um, we're very fortunate um, that we have that kind of support. And of course, the other part of it is that all of our speakers donate their time. Wow. So that's a pretty fantastic element. So it Dr. Really Cedars is. and the rest of the team, they all donate their time. So we're very fortunate from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so really, um, the fee is pretty nominal. Um, I think last year it was $5. Um, I, think, um, I think it's going to be the same this year as well. Um, and, um, and other than that, registration is pretty uh, low key. So how can I register for the conference? Yeah, so we have a web link right now. Um, you can go ahead and get on that. Um, I'm, hopefully we'll be able to supply that to you um, directly to your podcast. Yes, um, and it'll be in the show notes, so don't worry. <laughs> you can click <laughs> right into show notes and go straight to it. And actually, if you go to heartunitetheglobe.org, I have the little video that you made to promote okay. the conference, and right below that is the link to register for the conference. Yep. So it should be fabulous. About how many people do you expect to attend the conference this year? Yeah, I think um, in the past we get anywhere between 200 and 250 people. So it's wow. pretty well attended. That know. is really well attended. Okay. I want to get personal for a moment. Okay. I know to become a doctor, it takes a lot of time and education, <laughs> but to become a specialist like you, it takes even more. What made you interested in working with adults with congenital heart disease? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I always wanted to do cardiology. And really? Part, um, that's because my father had a heart attack when I was in college. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, so it had a huge impact on me. In fact, actually early on, um, before I went to college, I thought I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to be a, a prosecuting attorney. I wanted to be one of the good guys. Um, <laughs> but you know, when this happened, this completely changed my life. Yeah. Um, and so I had sort of started thinking about medicine, but when this happened, I definitely solidified my plans that I wanted to go into cardiology. Um, and then when I got to cardiology fellowship, my very first experience with a congenital heart patient was I was in the ICU. I was doing a transesophageal echo, a TEE, mm -hmm. um, on a patient who actually had suddenly arrested um, while playing softball. And he was a 20-something-year-old gentleman. And I thought, oh my gosh, what happens to 20-something-year-old people that they have a cardiac arrest? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I did the transesophageal echo, I didn't understand his heart at all because everything was crisscrossed in my mind. And I thought, how does this work? How is this even possible? And the truth of the matter is, um, I just hadn't actually learned a lot about congenital heart disease prior to this. And I had to open up textbooks and learn everything that I could. And then as I learned more, I found it to be really fascinating. And by the way, that patient did fantastic um, and left the hospital just a few days later, which was incredible to me. And so that really inspired me that there's this population of patients who's mm -hmm. reaching adulthood and actually doing really well despite all the things that happened to them yeah. um, and they need specialized care and as I was going along learning more about this I was taken under the wing of my mentor David Balser who's a pediatric interventional cardiologist at St. Louis Children's Hospital and I started going and watching him do cases mm -hmm. um, in the pediatric cath lab and then after that he let me start to scrub in and I started going there once a week and then once a week became every day and then I end up dedicating a full year um, to doing pediatric interventional cardiology in addition to my other um, adult cardiology and adult congenital training and so but really, there's a huge difference between pediatrics and there adults. There is. There's a wow. huge difference. Yeah. Okay. So th is that why you decided to stick with just working with adults? Yes. So okay. at the end of the day as you probably know um, Transcatheter interventions in adults with congenital heart disease are primarily done right now still in children's hospitals by pediatric right. interventional cardiologists because the techniques and the methods that are required to actually do these interventions and the interventions themselves are still very typical to the pediatric interventional cardiology armamentarium. And so it's a little bit different from what typically we learn in adult interventional cardiology training. There are similarities, but it's not quite the same. So if, one, if an individual like myself wants to learn how to do um, interventional cardiology in adults with congenital heart disease, the best place to learn, at least back then, and probably continues now, is in a pediatric cath lab okay. um, with a really great interventionalist like David Balzer. Um, and so he saw my interest in adult congenital heart disease, and he recognized, he had this vision that, um, you know, in the future we're going to have a lot of adults with congenital heart disease and we're going to have a lot of patients who need interventions, mm -hmm. transcatheter interventions and transcatheter valve implantations, um, that at the end of the day we're going to need um, people who can actually do adult congenital and interventional cardiology. Right. And so that's why he was interested in training me specifically in this field and that's why he took me under his wing. And so that's how I really got into this sub-sub specialty of adult congenital heart disease. I know, and that's the thing. How many years does it take you to go through <laughs> that kind of sub-sub specialty? Yeah, so, um, so I did four years of college. Um, I did both an MD and a PhD, so that actually took me a long time. Um, and then I did three years of internal medicine residency, and then I did three years of adult cardiology and adult congenital fellowship and then I did one year of adult interventional cardiology and one year of pediatric interventional cardiology. So by the time I finished I was PGY8, um, so postgraduate year eight, so eight years post medical wow. school training. Wow, So that is amazing. And you still love what you do. I do, I do. I love every day that I come to work. I love thinking about it even when I'm not at work. And But you know what, honestly, Anna, I think you know, the, the reality is the intellectual part of it is really great. And the satisfaction that I get from doing a great job or doing a very hard case is great. But I think at the end of the day, being in clinic with my patients and seeing them, and actually even seeing them outside of clinic at the symposium and other things, mm -hmm. that's the part that's really inspiring to me. Aww. That's the thing that I've actually really fallen in love with um, ever since I started practice. Sure. You know, I love being in the cath lab and I love doing these great cases, but at the end of the day, I love even more actually interacting with my patients and seeing them do well. I love mm -hmm. seeing a patient from, you know, they have an issue, 
we take care of it, and then we see them afterwards after they've recovered, and they're just, things are so much better. I love being able to see that happen. Oh yeah, it's gotta be great to see people when they're up and moving around and not in pain. Absolutely. Needing that heart pillow <laughs> just <laughs> to talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> just yeah. to walk down the hall or anything like that. So yeah. yeah, you guys do some amazing work. I think what's been interesting is, over the last 25 years, I've been watching interventional cardiology kind of come into the spotlight. Yeah. And from what I understand, that was commonly done much more, yeah. and then it kind of went out of vogue for a yeah. while, and open heart, open heart, open heart, open yeah. heart kind of just really stole the spotlight from you guys, and then they realized, hmm, interventional cardiology, fewer infections, faster recovery time, yeah. and hey, wait a minute, maybe we should get back in there. Plus, what has the 3D printer done to help you all? That's a great question. I think there's a lot of really cool technology that's coming about. I think one of the funny things about the way we do catheterization is, um, for those of you who don't know, when we actually work in the cath lab, it's in a two-dimensional x-ray system, right? So basically, we take the entire heart, and with x-ray, it turns into a two-dimensional screen image, right? And so what we lose with that is we lose the three-dimensional aspects, right. and the heart is very complicated, especially a heart that's been repaired in the past or palliated right. in the past. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're finding is that we have all these great technologies from all different areas outside of cardiology and outside of medicine mm -hmm. that we can now import into our arena. So for example, like you mentioned, 3D printing. So now what we can do, and um, we and the folks at TCH and the folks at UT have also done this too because it's just a great technology. You can actually do a CT scan on a patient and you can actually print their heart um, out of the 3D material. And then if you want to actually try an intervention before you do it in the patient, you can actually do it in this 3D printed model and see what happens to it. Yeah. So we've done this, um, and actually one of my colleagues here, um, Steve Little, Dr. Stephen Little, um, is actually doing this specifically looking at valvular interventions. And he's learning how he can actually recreate the textures of the valves so you can better simulate what that intervention is going to do and deform the tissues and how it's going to change it. Mm. Um, so you can have an even better simulation of what's going to happen. So what material do they use? Though? Because I know with the 3D printing, you can use a variety of materials. That's right. And I think a lot of that very much depends on what your application is. So for example, okay. if you want to have it crystal clear so you can actually see what's happening inside, that's a completely different material from the very soft material. And there are very, a wide spectrum of softness of materials, so you can mimic different types of tissue. Um, and that's where, that's where really the money is at the end of the day, is trying to mimic the tissue right. um, that you're actually simulating. So, so you can have the very, very hard, almost um, hard plastic type of material to the very soft, almost like a venous or vein tissue uh, wow. type of material. Wow. So are you excited about what you're seeing with science and technology and where it might lead you in the I future? Am. I am. And in fact, actually, it's funny because when I was a kid, I loved playing video games. And <laughs> video game technology is fantastic to mm -hmm. this, at this point. You have all these virtual reality techniques. You have these really high resolution, fast computing type of um, technologies that now we're beginning to be able to apply to healthcare. So, for example, there are people who are using virtual reality to sort of take that same 3D model from a CT scan so you can walk through the heart and actually understand how everything is related before you actually do anything to the heart. Wow. Very cool. Right? That is really cool. And plus, it would give you a chance to make a mistake without killing somebody, which right. is a good thing. <laughs> right. And to better understand the relationships, right? Because the, the thing at the end of the day is, like I said, in the cath lab, it flattens the entire heart. Right. right? Whereas if you can actually walk around inside the heart um, or use other technologies, like the, the technology that I typically use because um, it's sitting on my desk, is a technology called EchoPixel. An echo pixel mm. is basically, if you imagine having a 3D TV, like many people actually have 3D TVs at home. But instead of actually looking at TV, you're actually looking at a heart. And then what it allows you to do is it actually allows you to do exactly the same thing as the virtual reality, which is it allows you to dive through the heart and walk through the heart and see the different chambers of the heart. So for example, if I'm looking at a specific defect, so for example, a ventricular septal defect that has arisen from a previous patch that was put in and it's starting to fall apart, 50 years down the line, right, right. <laughs> because that's what success looks like, right? I mean, if you yeah. have a patient who was operated in their 20s and they're now 70 years of age, things happen, right? right. Um, and so, for example, in this particular situation, we were actually able to look inside his heart um, through this 3D TV and it stands out to you because it's like a 3D TV. 
And you can actually stereoscopically look at the actual defect that's arisen and how it relates to the different structures in the heart in three dimensions, which is the key element that we don't necessarily get when we're actually just looking at regular x-ray. Right. So that helps us to better plan how we're actually going to approach this and what kinds of devices we can actually put in there to plug that hole. What about robotic arms and Da Vinci and some of these other robotic techniques that we're hearing about? Are, yeah. are those commonly being used with our heart I'm patients? I'm so glad you're asking me about this because <laughs> this is something that we're really, really excited about. So, um, so we as an institution, especially the Heart and Vascular Center here, are very, very interested in how we can actually start to take advantage of robotics, especially robotics that is really advanced now um, in the 21st century. So, um, so I specifically have a research project in collaboration um, with our colleagues at Siemens, um, where we're actually learning how to use a robot to manipulate an intracardiac echocardiography catheter. So um, intracardiac echo, which is also called ICE, you may have heard that before, is basically being able to do echo from within the heart. So you get really great pictures, really high resolution pictures, because there's nothing in the way. Or you're looking wow. right at the heart. No, I've never heard of this before. You can do an echo inside the heart? Yes. How do you do that? How do you introduce it? Yeah, so it's pretty cool. So it's about two and a half to three millimeters in diameter. So it's a catheter, right? And then it has an ultrasound tip on it, just like any other echo. Okay. But it's been miniaturized, so it's about three millimeters in diameter. And then we introduce it through the vein of the leg, um, mm -hmm. and then it sits inside the heart. And because we can turn it around and we can tilt it um, forward, backwards, right, left, um, et cetera, we can actually look at all the different chambers of the heart. And so what's really cool now is that we're working on a robot that will actually do all this for us. So if we can teach the robot how to actually acquire these images, that robot can actually move the catheter for us, and then it, we can actually tell the robot, well, actually, I want to see this instead, or I want to see that instead. And of course, because it sits inside the heart, things are moving all the time, right? right so right. what we're going to do is we're going to teach the robot, well, these are the boundaries of the heart and we don't want you to touch the boundaries of the heart. So we want you to create the safety boundary so that you can make this as safe as possible. Okay, so if you can do that, what about ablations? That's a great question. So robotic ablation is actually even further. So, um, so some of my colleagues here in electrophysiology um, have been actually doing robotic ablations for quite some time. It's great for them because they can just sit down on a chair and just actually work with a joystick. Yeah, this is that video ablation. game <laughs> training that you were talking about. That's right. That's right. It's fantastic, right? I mean, it's so successful and, you know, just really gives you, I think in a lot of ways, I, I think that they think that it gives them a little bit better control. Um, but really, you know, you don't have to stand on your feet anymore. And one of the things that's really enabled it is the 3D technology, right? So no longer do they necessarily need that x-ray. They can create um, a, a shell of the heart um, um, in the computer that allows them to actually work using the robot. So they can actually know where they are in three dimensions. Will you be showing us some of those techniques? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. We'll be seeing that. Yeah, event. we're gonna. Okay, yeah, everybody so. has to come. You have to come <laughs> to the conference this year. This is going to be amazing. Yeah, we're very excited. I think you know, as I as I mentioned, the Heart and Vascular Center is very interested in how robotics can make things safer and more efficient in the care of heart disease. Okay, so who should attend this conference? I think honestly everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. If you're curious at all about the human body, you should be here. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I think there's truth to that, right? Because I think you mentioned something really important early on, which is that everyone knows somebody with mm -hmm. congenital heart disease. That's right. Right. So I think if you think about 1% of the population being affected or 1% of all live births being affected, that means that if you ask anybody in any given room, they know somebody. They may not know that they know somebody, but they mm -hmm. definitely know somebody who has a heart defect and may have even had surgery to have it repaired or multiple surgeries to have it repaired. And so I think in a lot of ways, there's truth to that, that I think this can be important for almost every single person um, mm -hmm. because I think that almost every single person is could potentially be that person that makes a difference in somebody who has a heart defect's life. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's encouraging them to come back to see a cardiologist for their care, whether it's encouraging them to get with a primary care physician, whether it's to just make sure that they get in touch. You know, I think everybody can potentially make a huge difference in one of those heart warriors' lives. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think that there's so much to learn here, and you just never know until you start talking to people. I just got new windows on my house, and I was talking to the salesman, 
And he, I told him I had a podcast. And he said, well, what's your podcast about? And when I told him, he said, oh my gosh, I had a bicuspid aortic valve and yeah. I didn't find out until I was in my 40s. Yeah. He told me he had been playing baseball and soccer yeah. and all kinds of sports and all of a sudden it was hard to walk across the parking lot. Wow. And so I've read that up to 3% or 3 to 5% of the population can actually have a bicuspid aortic valve. Mm -hmm. So really, if a bicuspid aortic valve is a congenital heart defect, which we know it is, then it affects a great deal more than 1% of the population. That's We're looking true. at probably more like four or five percent, aren't we? Yeah. That's right, absolutely. Now, do you do any kind of training during the symposium, like CPR training, or is that something that you might look at doing in the future? Yeah, so that's one of our favorite things, is I think we want to arm people with as many skills um, before they leave as possible. And so mm -hmm. one of our favorite things is to actually have a team of volunteers come and teach CPR. Um, one of the other things that we really love having um, is just providing care. So we're actually going to have volunteers come and do um, do healthcare screening. So they're going to do blood pressures, et cetera. Oh, wow. And you know maybe somebody will walk away with a little bit more information um, and um, and an action item that when they go home that they do need to see a physician um, or they do need to see their local healthcare provider for something specific. So um, so we're really hoping that we can give it, um, people as much value and as much information as possible and really send them out with. Um, being another one of our ambassadors that they will help us to make sure they pass on this information, that they pa pay it forward, this, mm -hmm. um, these skills that we're hopefully um, giving them. Absolutely. Well, tell us the name of the conference and the hospital because there are so many hospitals in the Houston area. <laughs> Where do people need to come and what date? Yes, so it's October 12th and mm -hmm. that's actually the fifth annual Adult Congenital Heart Symposium here at Houston Methodist. But even though it's here, we're actually bringing all of our friends from our neighboring uh, programs. That's where we get our strength from, is that we team up with all the programs around the area um, to teach the important things that we're going to be doing there. So, Well, thank you so much for coming on the show finally and for letting me come to Houston, this beautiful studio. For those of you who are actually seeing this, we're in this wonderful studio and we're having a great time, but we're going to have an even better time on October 12th. I hope everyone will be here. Absolutely. Thanks, okay. Anna. Thanks.